2023 Board of Education regular meeting minutes, and we're accepting a donation from Shutterfly to Valley View School. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll sure. make a motion. Oh, okay, I heard Tim. Tim. Thank you, Tim. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thanks, Meg. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Audience of citizens, do we have anyone in the audience or anyone online who wishes to address the board at this time? Nothing in the chat? Okay. All right. Then we can move right along to our Portland Public School Spotlight. And I believe we have folks from DACA here with us this evening. You're welcome to join us at the podium. Hello. Hi. Um, good evening. I'm Anna Terry, the high school business teacher and DECA advisor at Portland High School. And before I turn it over to um, these great guys that joined us today, um, CTE month is the month of February. So career technical education, it has its own month. And it's career and technical student organization DECA is our organization here at the school. And we've been growing since I started back in 2015, 16. Um, we've had some recognition in the last couple of years with what we've been doing over at the school. And I just wanted to give a little highlights on a few things. Um, just recently, we were recognized for being one of only, um, of only 1,300 schools, but there's over 3,500 DECA charters in the United States. So Portland High School um, participated in high school challenges campaigns that they had us doing, and Portland was, received a certificate for um, doing some awesome work with Greystone. We sent them some community outreach is what we were doing. Um, in addition to that, um, Portland High School last year received a certificate of recognition because we were the highest increase of membership in a Connecticut high school last year. And it doesn't sound like a lot when you say, oh, well, we have 35 members this year. But when you think that that's nearly 10% of our high school population, mm -hmm. it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, but we went, it was about a 50% growth in the year before, and I believe it's going to be about another 50% growth this year. So we're doing big things over there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my crew, and I'm so grateful for them because they are really awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, hello, um, I'm Dorothy. Um, I am the Vice President of Hospitality uh, um, in my DECA chapter in this town, and I am also a state officer. I work with uh, about six other people um, at the state level. Um, so I was one of six who went on the power trip. It was me and some other juniors and Miss Terry. And this was in November, we went to Washington, D.C., and it was probably such an eye-opening and such a fun experience to go on. Um, here I have some of the pictures of us in several locations while we were on our trip, and if we go to the next slide, please. So, um, um, relating to like our DECA-oriented things on the trip, we had sessions where um, state officers from around the country they would run these groups and we would work on our leadership skills and bonding exercises and things to just better get us to want to talk to more people and learn more about our categories and learn to see what people know and don't know about business and grow friendships, um, a way for us to connect with each other without necessarily using social media. We use this app called Goose Chase and through Goose Chase, we got to take selfies with people. We got to find out who has the same birthday as us, who has the same favorite color as us, and also meet some really cool college representatives. Um, and then on, I believe it was second or third night, we met this artist who was very funny and comedic, and he painted us that lion while he was talking. It was very impressive to see the way he used his painting skills, um, but also um, hone in on like life lessons, which was something I kept with me. Um, and then we had our other speaker, which was the day that we left. Um, he really focused on finding the true you and realizing that it doesn't matter what other people think, it matters what you think about yourself. Um, and then we also had a night tour where we got to see places around Washington, D.C. at night as a group. 
which I thought was really fun because all the lights, it was so beautiful. Next slide, please. So here are some of the mon monuments and statues you saw. Sometimes it was just passing by on the bus or sometimes we generally stop and go take pictures. Um, at the MLK monument, I remember there was another tour going on, not deck related. And the man who was speaking about the monument was pretending that he was MLK himself and he recited a part of this speech, which I thought was really inspiring. And I was very in awe and I was like moved by like the way he said it, because I could really feel his emotion. Um, next slide, please. And then we have some places we also went. We went to the um, National Museum of American History. Um, I was very shocked by how modern the exhibits were. There was a lot of older stuff regarding presidents and the government. And then there was some newer stuff regarding how empowered women have become over the years, which I thought was very nice being a girl myself. Um, mm -hmm. So that was really nice to see. And then the graveyards, it was captivating to see the amount of people that have served in our country and how they're honored by many. Next slide, please. And then of course, not everything was about DECA. We had some food, went to some pretty cool places. Um, we saw a basketball game. Washington did win, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, I just thought I would throw that in to show that it's not all business. We do like to have a little bit of fun sometimes. <laughs> Next slide, please. And I'll hand it over to Philip. Hello, I'm Philip, and I'm the VP of Finance in DECA. So what's coming up with DECA uh, in the next year or so? We already have had a lot of really successful trips with Power Trip and uh, the tournaments last year. Uh, but what's coming up this year? So we're going to have SCDC, which is the state championship in March, March 1st. And it's really exciting because we have a lot of uh, people who are really passionate about a lot of different topics relating to business in our uh, DECA group, we have uh, a couple people who are going to be doing sports and entertainment. We have uh, three people, myself included, uh, who are going to be doing entrepreneurship. And we have a lot of a lot of excitement about all these topics. Uh, learn about them, more more about them, and uh, practice our skills uh, when we go to uh, the tournament. So after SCDC, uh, if we do qualify, it's uh, we actually had two people last year who actually did qualify for uh, the ICDC, which is uh, the international uh, DECA tournament or ch uh, challenge. And um, that is going to be held in Florida this year. So uh, we're all really excited about that. We are uh, trying to, we're working really hard to learn more about our uh, unique um, uh, topics and relating to business. And yeah, so that's what's coming up in terms of uh, tournaments this year. Next slide, please. Many of the members, oh, oh, oh hello. First, I should probably introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Amelia. I am a new DECA member this year, and I quite, I honestly have quite enjoyed being in DECA so far. Um, many of our Many of our members are involved in in several other activities in the inside the school, such as the school musical, several different sports, and uh, several different athletics, as well as different act more academic extracurriculars, such as robotics and math league. And uh, because so many of our because so many of our DECA members are because so many of our deck members are active in other in other school activities, um, that gives them that gives them a chance to also interact and communicate with uh, with a variety of other students and further both um potentially increase the quantity of people in DECA as well as as well as spread the knowledge, as well as spread the knowledge of career and technical education. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> All right. So for the 
upcoming fundraisers this year. We had a lot of really successful fundraisers last year, so uh, we're continuing uh, with the strong impetus uh, in DECA with uh, some really interesting and fun fundraisers this year. Uh, namely, one that we just uh, did, uh, the DECA Secret Snowflake fundraiser was very successful, and we put um, four York pe peppermint patties each in a bag, and we sold them uh, during both lunch periods. Uh, so that was really great. It was a great way to um, you know, give back to uh, the school community and also raise some money for DECA, which was really nice. Um, we also did uh, the Kiss the Seniors Goodbye fundraiser. This is actually something we did last year, and I think we're probably going to continue doing it this year. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's uh, similar to the Secret Snowflake. We're going to be doing some Hershey Kisses in each bag, and we're going to be doing a fundraiser both at, at both of the lunch periods as well. So really excited about that. And um, Dorothy, would you like to take it over for the Shane Yeah. Sure. Um, so... Before I mention that, I just like to mention we also have our annual poinsettia sales. That's in December, I believe, maybe late November, but December, of my ability, we have some pretty, very pretty colors. Um, I remember those like pink and white and yellow. I love them. I buy them. You should buy them also. <laughs> <laughs> we also have our egg hunt, which we started last year, um, which is where um, we go to schools and we obviously fundraise and all that and basically we want to bring a little joy into kids and maybe families easter and we want to um spread some easter eggs around your yard with your permission of course and um just kind of be like the easter bunny for the day and hopefully that will bring a, a smile to your kids or your family's faces when seeing that um and then we have our shamrock um fundraiser I just like to mention this is something that um, MD has partnered with DECA, but we don't do all these fundraisers just for the money. We do it because we care about our community. We want to put smiles on people's faces. We just want to see people happy and people sharing, um, hopefully, lifelong memories with one another. Okay, so I know Philip mentioned that we have ICDC and SCDC coming up. Um, SCDC, I definitely see um, a few of us walking, um, walking up those stairs to receive our awards, but I'm hoping that we can also do the same thing at ICDC. And something that we want to see are those ties um, of our Highlanders wearing them. These are ties that were created um, through a business that Miss Terry knows, and we're hoping um, to sell them starting this year. And we're hoping to see not only just Highlander students, we're hoping to see people of Cortland wearing them around, maybe even at a board of ed meeting, we'll see it. Hopefully, <laughs> maybe at a basketball game, you're in the stands or a soccer game, you're in the stands in the fall and you're like, hey, look, I'm wearing your tie. So <laughs> yes, this is very new and we're really excited to start it and we're hoping to have it in the next years to come. Are there any questions? Anything you want to know about us that we didn't cover? When, how, when you go to Florida, if, if that is a plan, um, the fundraisers that you're doing will um, help to defray the cost? Exactly. Um, state competition is about $100 per student. And because of the fundraising that we've done so far, um, they're only being charged $25 per person. So they're oh, defraying nice. the cost per states. Okay. Um, Fingers crossed that we have qualifiers this year. We will be doing some heavy fundraising. The Easter egg fundraiser last year did a lot for us. Um, I don't know if anybody, did anybody see it here last year? But we do, we we called it Egg Your House and we sold uh, candy filled eggs. And on Saturday night before Easter Sunday morning, we went around and hit no, the eggs. You didn't. Yes, we did. <laughs> and we did nearly 100 dozen eggs last year. So oh, we sure. have ordered supplies so that we can do a lot more than that this year. So it'll be when we didn't even really promote it well last year. So we're hoping that that will get out there this year. So you should let us know when those things are going on so that we can participate <laughs> and get our eggs and get our poinsettias and all that fun Absolutely. stuff. That you guys we, are doing. We, try, it's, um, we try to get it out there, but it, sometimes we feel a little bit limited on where and how to share. We're getting better at that with having more students involved in these types of meetings and so forth. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for having us. Thank you so Thank much. much. Thank you all. Thank you very much.
All right. So next up, we have our student representative report. And Dorothy, you're just going to stay at the yeah, podium. <laughs> is great. Is Leah? Oh, Leah's with us online. <laughs> Wonderful. Happy to have you both with us. Okay. Um, I will start before Leah starts. Um, so on February 16th, the high schoolers, we have our um, band and chorus concert where we'll sing some alone, we'll sing some together, we'll get to see um, what the honors band and acapella have been going on um, doing during their class time. Um, we also have the Greenhouse Garden Club. They are currently selling carnations and roses. Um, and you can put a little note on it, um, a little piece of paper that they hand you when you um, buy it. And they're hoping to, they're planning on selling them on, I mean, giving them out on Valentine's Day. And their intention is to just bring a little joy and a little love into someone's day on Valentine's Day, since you have to be in school that day. <laughs> um, and then um, I think that's all I have. Yeah. So the senior trip to New York City is on February 22nd. We will be seeing Harry Potter on Broadway, ice skating at Rockefeller Center, and finishing the night with dinner at Hard Rock Cafe. Um, the girls basketball senior night is tonight. Wrestling senior night is tomorrow the 8th. And boys basketball and cheerleading senior night is February 14th. This year, we have multiple capstones that are happening during these events, which include a stuffed animal drive for CCMC, which is on the 3rd a bracelet fundraiser for cancer awareness on the 8th and a food drive on the 8th as well. Excellent, thank you both. Are there any questions for our student reps? No, all right, thank you ladies. <laughs> Communications and updates, Dr. Britton. So, a um, couple uh, Communications for you. First, I, I did include, we did include with your packet tonight, two emails from uh, parents. Um, you know, the, um, their, their current position. So let me pause for a moment, see if you have any question about either the email communications, the resignation, or the enrollment figures that I included for that board. Okay, so then let me let me move on to some of, of my reports. First, um, I asked Mr. Shea to join us. Um, Bob, why don't you come on up? Um, I, I figured he would be able to give you more details and if you had questions. Uh, you can ask him directly, but I'd ask Mr. Shea to update you all on some challenges our facilities faced, in, faced during the Arctic blast we received recently. Um, and then, of course, an update on the truck, where we are and how we're progressing. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, yeah, we had a few challenges, I'm sure, um, not only here, but like, hopefully you haven't had any at your homes. Um, but, you know, we had a, a pretty rapid freeze which is very difficult, but the backside of that is usually the worst part. It's when it starts to thaw just as fast, if not faster. So we had some uh, issues, Valley View, we experienced a broken pipe. Um, we're trying to isolate, um, we lost the boilers that evening. We're trying to find out why those did not reset. So the, the unfortunate part of that is um, we had planned, I had planned a early building check because of the temperature, but I didn't want to do it very early in the morning. So I, I made sure that my um, senior custodian staff went in around noontime to try to 
find a good median and we're lucky because that broke that break uh most likely occurred about 10 minutes before sal uh, made it to value view if he was there at 7 a.m which he usually does seven eight o'clock his his daily checks or his weekend building checks i would have ran until someone saw it on hall hill or high street so we were able to mitigate that fairly quickly find uh, the shutoff valves which are difficult at times but i'm working on that trying to get everything identified in the schools that i can find um you know it's difficult based on their age but we're going to get there to make things a little easier but we were able to that was a heater that was in the vestibule um between the two doorways going into the rear where the gymnasium is a valley view so what happened was because the temperature went down and that heater wasn't working that was probably the worst compromised area of the school so that failed we lost the pipe inside that heater unit we were able to stabilize that we'll have to get that repaired um, we also lost the um, a freeze stat went in the gymnasium. Um, it's not a rooftop, but basically um, the gymnasium heating system, which is isolated from the school. So we were able to maintain a cool temperature. Uh, nothing better than seeing the kids run around in their jackets in gym, in gym class and they have no issues with temperature. Um, so we've had that fixed today. Um, there's a few issues there. Um, believe it or not, fuses are six or eight months to get them. Supply chain. Supply okay. chain for fuses. So um, worked most of the evening last night, found five fuses, we need two. Um, those are going to be, and that's not hampering the ability that the heat is on there. Uh, it's just um, one of the fans is, is obviously not running because of the fuses. We lost a bunch of fuses because of that issue. Uh, so, you know, we'll be back online. Uh, we were able to, I was able to find fuses out Midwest and they'll be here tomorrow. So we're going to have to think ahead on buying some, not an expensive item, maybe to get it here tomorrow, but, mm. um, you know, just stocking some things that now are becoming difficult to get for us for repairs. So I'm looking ahead on that. Uh, we also had an incident at 1230 a.m. Sunday morning. I got a call from uh, Hartford Steam Boiler. We have uh, moisture sensors at the biz that were part of a free program that they put together a few years ago. We just updated all those moisture sensors. sensors. Um, I think in September of this year, we did that. Well, come to find out, I got a call saying that one was targeting moisture. So we deployed down to the brownstone and we had a broken pipe. And that moisture sensor was floating in the puddle that was caused by that. We had a class. It works very well, very well. So I was very happy to get that because we have no other detection really other than that. So this is a program that I actually reached out today for to see if we can advance this program into other areas, especially in our boilers because they have a temperature sensor as well so that if the boiler goes down and the temperature drops in the boiler, we know it's not running. We can be alerted to go to the school before those things happen. So I'm working on those programs, but we were able to shut that off. It took a bit. Uh, we had a little bit of water damage, but nothing permanent. Um, we got that cleaned up by 2.30 or so. We were back at home around that time in the morning. So uh, we're making those little repairs. Um, luckily enough, we didn't have to call in any insurance and no damage to the buildings from that water, just a little bit of drying out. And we didn't um, lose any time in classrooms, which is the most important, um, or moving any classrooms for that. So um, thanks to the custodians for working with me. Um, at the speed of, <laughs> you know, that I like to, to do things. So that worked out well. So the track. So we are there and I am happy to report and I still have to look at budgetary numbers tomorrow um, because uh, we, we didn't get a chance to do that. But as early as this morning, uh, I sent as many construction bid documents that I can find in my old history along to our new consultant so that he can put the front end documents together, which he was able to complete today with that information. So I'm happy about that. The bid spec is 222 pages long. Um, and that includes a lot of the prints and miscellaneous legal information, um, not only what we need to bid. I will have to spend some time reviewing that, but it's been, it's off to finance um, to make sure that it gets a legal check. I'll get it both um, out to Stephanie and Dr. Britton tomorrow uh, for your review. Uh, there is no estimate on price. 
because he wants to talk with me. There's a few options to go before we kind of get an estimate. He did say it's a little higher than he thought, but then again, you know, we were kind of under that number, um, you know, in the discussion. I'm not, no, don't know if he's looking at our original number or the extra funding we put in. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll be talking about that, but that has to go out very soon so that we can review the bids that come in. It should stay out for at least two weeks. Uh, and then we have to make a, we have to, to award that by the 15th of March. So we're getting close. So uh, I was happy to see that it was done today. So hopefully we'll be on time. Um, we'll have to discuss budget, those numbers, the options and what we select. Uh, but all the work has been done. The core boring is the biggest obstacle on the job. What we found for substructure is what's going to add a little money to this job. The whole backside of that track, we dug or we core bored through the track um, up to five feet, and there is no virgin soil on that end of the track, meaning that that whole backside was filled originally when it was, when it was established, which means that's the area that's settling over time because there's no hard path virgin soil underneath what they put on top of it to, you know, to build the first track. So based on all those studies, the geo studies that I looked at, um, we're looking at two options and I have to decide engineering wise what the best is. Uh, I think option one, which is stripping the rubber off of the track, taking the existing material that's under it, pulverizing that or reclaiming it and using that as base, considering we paid for it 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we should do that. Mm -hmm. um, I've had extreme luck with that building roads. Uh, utilizing that material, it's fairly hard. Rather than digging out and bringing new in, we can utilize that and then remove what we need to. So I think that's the option. It's a little less expensive than removing and bringing in all new fill. So I have to look at those numbers. So that'll be some of the work that I'll be doing this week with our consultant engineer to see which direction we're going to go. So hopefully we'll have, well, this week we will have an idea so that we're ready to go to bid to see what these numbers come back at and see where we are. Estimates are always usually a little higher. They need to be um, for our talking points and hopefully we'll get some uh, good leverage on some bids that people you know, wanna be busy early this year. So that's uh, about where we are. If, the, if anybody, you know, obviously we'll share it for, for you to look at the prints, look at the engineering that's been done um, to tell us where we are. We got to definitely do new drainage there. We found that some of the drainage is compromised and that probably is some of the reason why we have moisture that's so much closer to the track. And that's why we get cracking under that subsurface. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking at redoing that. I'm a big fan of alternates on bids in the event that we can do more because prices come in less. So if you don't have alternates to do more on your initial bid, it's very difficult to add them later. So we're going to be looking at alternates for the possible shop area, which will be moved closer to the bleachers and alternates for fencing. And then um, just a, another area to do with the drainage. So those will give us option based on, you know, overall price. If the numbers come in good and, and we can add some of those alternatives, we will to make it even, uh, you know, a better facility. Well, that's where we are. Dave? Is the bid for the whole job? Because I thought the top is a specialized process for a specialized company. Whole job. They'll contract it out. Oh, the contract. Yeah. So depending on who gets the bid, who is awarded the contract, it all depends on what they're specializing in. So okay. lots of times they'll specialize in one part of it. Maybe it's the excavation and the, and the, the ground portion of it. And then they'll just hire in the contractors to do the overlay and the rubberized base and stuff. Yeah. And paving. Yeah. Hmm. You can get many, <laughs> but you'll get one price back. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Well, I mean, just, you said that the, the, the Valley View uh, pipe bursting, there wasn't really any damage to the school. There wasn't like wood or carpeting. Or... No, we were able to um, get both machines running to suck the water up at the same time, just putting the hose that oh, yeah. the machine was right. sucking the water up out the door. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, we were just lucky timing wise. I got there um, just a little after Sal did and we were able to get the machines running and then I was able to get up into the ceiling and trace some pipes back to find an isolation valve 
which we were able to just shut the floor of water off. So instantly we yeah. just turned to get the water off the floor. It's yeah. all tile there mm -hmm. in that area. Mm -hmm. And probably six or seven feet into the gym is where the water made it, but we were able to get that up quick oh, okay. with those machines that we have, the little Zambonis, I call them. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> as fast as you can get them around, you can get the water off. So we don't see any issues. Drying so carpet. Fortunate. Yeah, yeah cool. we're fortunate that that area was really not a carpeted area or, you know, so we got lucky there. And brownstone was uh, a few ceiling tiles in the basement. It drained down into the maintenance room um, directly from the classroom. So we were lucky we had a a floor drain where the pipes were going through mm. and it ended up going there to the basement and then it was right in front of one of the doors which had a drain on the other side on the lower level so we were you know our area didn't grow too big it was in the hallway a little bit but we were able to do the same thing with the machines there and until we can we tried to i tried to make a clamp because i couldn't find the shutoff valve but that water is 200 degrees so i had a little difficult time Put my hands on the pipe and trying to get things done but we, we, we made it happen we found the shut off final that's great so everything's been tagged <laughs> so we know where the shut offs are yeah. <laughs> forward, every time we have it we yeah. lost an outside faucet at valley view too at the same time we were leaving and saw the water flowing there so we were able to shut that down as well oh, wow. so that was just another freeze point rare occasion mm -hmm. good that sounds like all things considered we were kind of fortunate. We were. <laughs> Somebody's living right. Yeah. We did well, good. I, I think I think the good fortune, Bob, is that we have you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very man. high quality. We have a great crew, guys. So. They are. You're right. Two thirty in the morning. Ladies. It's crazy great. cold, crawling great. around the ceiling tiles to to fix yeah. these things so that we don't lose instructional time. That's the good fortune that I'm. I'm very. My right. staff might not. <laughs> <They're> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I can't say enough about the staff, the men and women of the because they're 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 just willing to go to the. Yeah. Yeah, we just want those places to be good. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, please extend our gratitude. Yeah, I will. Absolutely. Thank you so okay. much, Bob. All right. Thanks. Okay. We'll go dive in the video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a couple of things I want to um, also uh, make sure that that I recognize um, Joe Santavinier. So Joe Santavinier, as you know, is our our correct liaison for our open choice liaison. We have tonight, as you know, 350 people at this UConn basketball game. I can, I'll can i check the score for you. 46-29 UConn. Hey, it's a good game. Over number 10, Marquette. But we, you know, I think that our students are going to be recognized with the things, things flashing on the billboards mm -hmm. or there and great. But this is this is the hard work. I mean, Joe did put a ton of work coordinating all of this, communicating and getting the tickets, emailing the tickets out to everybody. And as you know, we we um, we do this so that we can have our Portland families interact with our Hartford Open Choice families. It's a, a wonderful opportunity for our, our students and Hartford students to meet in Hartford and, and experience these events. Comes on the heels of, and we'll likely do it again in the spring, a yard boats game. And then we did Hartford Athletics in the fall. Um, and all of this, of course, is funded out of the um, grants that we received for part of our participation with Open Choice. But I'm sure they're having a good time tonight. I'm kind of bummed that we're here doing this as opposed to <laughs> you know, having fun at the UConn game. But um, well, we'll be at the Arco team. We'll make sure we won't schedule those on that. That's important. <laughs> um, so thank you to Joe for putting that together. I know it's a, it's a lot of work coordinating all that, but I'm sure they're having an awful lot of fun. A couple of things I just wanted to you know reflect on with you and you know, extend some gratitude both to Mr. Hershon and to Jesse Ravicki um, for organizing. There was an incredibly powerful um, uh, presentation called Ryan's Story. And if you just Google it, next time you're, it's um, got it here in front of me. It was this, this father who came and spoke first with the parents of middle school and um, brownstone parents, and then all of our students in grades six, seven, and eight, and recounted uh, his experience with his son who took his own life and, and online bullying. It was a very, very moving, very powerful um, presentation. And I can tell you, you could have heard a pin drop. And you know, I, I think, I know our students got the right message there, which is, you know, treat each other kindly, treat each other with, with uh, the respect that we all deserve. And in those cases where you are witnessing acts of bullying or are perceiving it, you know, be an upstander. Don't be a bystander. And that, that was really the message of it beyond the tragedy um, that this, this uh, gentleman experienced with his son, Ryan, 
you know, the message there was very reduced. And I know it was impactful. I saw a lot of, a lot of moved students during that event. And I know that it went well um, with our parents the evening before. That was a collaboration between the middle school and Portland Youth Services. So I, I really want to extend our gratitude to Jesse and Mr. Hershon for, for finding this program and bringing it to us. And I think it sparked a really important conversation at the middle school and with our sixth grade students at Brownstone. Did any of you get to see the parents' presentation? No, you didn't? I didn't no, I didn't. Well, Google, take a look. Next time you're in front of Google in a few minutes, Google Ryan's story and, and you'll you'll see this. Um, this, this you know, somebody who's taken a tragedy and, and clearly made something um, uh, beneficial or helpful for the rest of us out of it. Um, so thank you, Mr. Hershon and, and Jesse for putting that together. Then that same week, you know, uh, we are part of this school-based diversion grant receiving um, quite a bit of money. This is a grant that um, Mr. Hershon and Eric wrote, uh, Eric Martin wrote. So last week um, on Thursday and Friday, Portland Middle School hosted, I, I'm gonna say about 100, 125 educators from around the state. They came here um, uh, to, to a two-day in-service on restorative justice, on restorative practices. You know, and these are efforts that were traditional, call them disciplinary, traditional modes of consequences are more exclusionary to uh, suspend, detend, in-school suspension, you know, punish. The restorative approach is way more healing, way more relationship-based. Now, restorative practices aren't in and of itself a panacea, or, or, but it's another tool in the tool belt. And I did get up to, I think I spent a good part of the day Thursday and only a little bit of Friday out of many things going on. I think it was other good news about this grant which mm -hmm. got a lot of my attention. Mm -hmm. But what I did see, it was very powerful and it was, was wonderful to see all the educators from across the state there. And again, I, I want to give a shout out to Eric and to um, uh, Mr. Hershon for, for getting us the SBDI grant. And then of course, for all of the educators across the state who came here to learn about those restorative practices. Um, if you want to know more about that, I'm happy to share with you. But I, I do see it as a really important opportunity for us to you know, continue to address um, students in a, a healing relationship with these um, I thought that was a very nice sort of dovetail, and it got me reflecting a lot about many of the things we're doing district-wide in, in, in the name of diversity, equity, inclusion, positive school climate and things we're doing. It's not all perfect, it doesn't always work great, but you know, I, I see lots of efforts, you know, reflected both in Ryan's story, in the restorative practices, in see something, see, say something uh, that we have up and running at the middle school, in our SEL curriculum that we've now rolled out, it's called Second Step in Grades K throughout, through eight. in our partnership with the conference, National Conference for um, community and justice, which is the, the Bridges program, which is the student-based leadership training we're doing with kids to help get, equip them with the skills mm -hmm. to promote a positive school climate. Um, with the PD that's focused um, on, you know, again, building positive school climate. We're doing a lot of that work through CREC. And then, of course, with our ongoing uh, PBIS, positive behavior supports, and the DESA screener that we're rolling out this year to help identify um, students to sort of mental health screen. So, We've got a lot of work to do, you know, there are, but we're doing an awful lot. Mm -hmm. I see a, I see a lot of movement and a lot of things being done. Um, and it's, in many cases, it's two steps forward and one step back. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of work, but it is progress. You know, it, is, it is forward momentum and, and um, these are exciting things. Now, of course, my big you know, piece of excitement for the night is, of course, None of these things would be possible if not for a talented team of clinicians and mental health professionals shepherding, stewarding these practices. And as you know, this year we were we are blessed because we've been applying our ESSER funds to make sure that we have clinicians and mental health professionals in all of our schools. Mm -hmm. One of the things we uh, funded last year, our funding this year, and had planned to use our ESSER funds for next year was for us to maintain a full-time social worker at the middle school. So uh, earlier this year, we learned of a grant that was put out there for um, a mental health support. So I wanna thank Dawn, I wanna thank Chuck, and of course, Stephanie for helping me put together the grant. We submitted it to the state, 92 districts. It was a competitive grant, put in their, their applications for this. And we were one of 20 that received the grant. And I know that um, Trisha shared the press release with you. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. That means we're getting $117,000 this year, $117,000 next year, and then $80,000 the year after. 
So mm -hmm. short term for this year's budget, and Stephanie's going to give you a full report. We've been talking to you a lot this year about a deficit we've been projecting. Well, we're in pretty good shape now. So Steph, not only because of this grant, but because of other things that are going in our favor. You know, sometimes the fiscal winds blow in our direction. Sometimes they blow against us. Up until about three weeks ago, it was a headwind. Now we got the wind in our sails. Right? So Stephanie's going to talk to you tonight about how we climbed our way out. This certainly helps that. So the $117,000 we're getting this year is going to be applied towards the benefits and the salary for that social worker, which will allow us to apply the ESSER funds we would have otherwise spent for that to ledger out the paraprofessionals we have. Right. So as you know, this year we added paraprofessionals, we added a kindergarten teacher, we increased our ELL teacher, we increased subpay. Um, we did add some known deficits. And then of course that layers on top of some of Dawn's expenses that we know we've been managing um, in our support services. But this certainly helps us get out and into a very good fiscal position where you know at this point, if we were to end the fiscal year, we would land it on budget or potentially with a surplus. Mm -hmm. Now we still have five months to go. Mm -hmm. Stephanie's gonna watch those number numbers carefully and, and uh, give you her report tonight. But I'm delighted that we learned that we got those funds next year. This year, so they're impacting this year's budget. And it's going to invite a discussion this spring about how we now reapply those ESSER funds that are available for next year. I'm, I'm certainly not prepared tonight. I'm sort of digesting this. I'm not prepared to make any recommendations yet, but um, it's an exciting opportunity for us to figure how we'll, we'll spend that, those uh, COVID relief dollars in the next fiscal year. Yeah. That was a lot, but it all kind of dovetails together. It does, it does. <laughs> That's really exciting news about the grant. Yeah. Congratulations, Charles. Thank you. Yeah. Um, exciting. Very exciting. Are there questions for Charles about anything that he just presented on? There's a lot. No, no. All right. Thank you for that update. Of course. Uh, Stephanie got a financial report this evening. Um, so Charles basically said most of it. He always gets to see the good news. <laughs> um, but really, it's everything that Charles just said. Um, you know, it, it was two weeks ago when I was looking at a four hundred thousand dollar deficit and not happy. <laughs> um, we met, went over a few things, kind of came up with what if situation, and then a week later we hired um the speech teacher so that significantly helped what the end of the Cheshire Fitness contract would be um so that helped with that um and then when we found this out on Friday it came to the weekend <laughs> <laughs> um you know we're still we're not going to go to spending frenzy but you know we're still going to try and stay as minimal as we can because we now fortunately hopefully we'll be able to do a fund 11 transfer um, a lunch fund transfer, end of year purchases. Um, but again, it's February 7th at <laughs> 7.44. So anything could change tomorrow. Um, so as of right now, we are we are doing good. <laughs> so we, you've eliminated the $400,000 deficit? I'm good. just, I'm, I don't know. So you just heard 117,000. Well, this was our doom and gloom prior. What's that? This is the doom and gloom that we had right before we hired the speech teacher. So I had, I was able to take away the contract of so services. So that set aside that was there to cover those services. The services had for Cheshire decide. Fitness. That, that was three hundred. That's the other. It was about two hundred fifty thousand dollars. And could we still have to keep some contracted to carry over? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> we had to keep some dollars in there um, for additional help or whatever. But so I went that four hundred went down to about one hundred seventeen. Or no, I'm sorry, about 129. And then the 117 came in, a few other things came into line. We got um um ESSER two homeless transportation grant. I just happened to click on something oh, okay. to draw down and saw we had fifty eight hundred dollars. Yeah. So that was another fifty eight hundred dollars that we got. Um open choice. We still haven't found out. We know we have 70 students, but we also receive additional funds um, depending on how many students we have per grade, per class. So there's always a little addition that comes in after that I, you know, I don't know about. So I'm 
I'm again February seventh, seven forty five. <laughs> We're doing we're doing okay. Let's not break the corks on the champagne right now. <laughs> and other things like it's been a warm winter. Right? Well, yeah, and we're still looking into the gas bill issue. Um, we have not gotten the next. There's been an issue with the easel reading for the gas um, for the buses. So I'm still waiting. I think we're only up till November. So I think we still need December and January to see. But like I said, we were averaging about $9,000 a month for gas. Um, Another piece that also helped with the deficit was um, some of the IDA grant funds. Um, we still have, I don't know if everybody knows, but IDA grant is two years. So we have a carryover year and a current year. Mm -hmm. And Portland's been fortunate enough to only do one year at a time. Most districts have to tap into their current year one. Um, we started maybe about a year and a half, two years ago, going a little bit in um, to help with offset some of the paraprofessional that we've added in. Um, this year, we have about $25,000 that we can use for purchase services so that I can uh, put towards some of the extra additional services um, that we've encountered. So that was another about 25,000 that I was able to mm -hmm. draw out of the deficit um, with that. And then we also still have, we haven't gone into the current year IDA as well. So we have that kind of in there too. So any questions? Got the wind in her back. Let's go. February seventh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> um, all right, Dawn, Director of Student Services Report. I think we're ready for you. <laughs> good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good to see you all. Me too. Um, I have really good news in my update. It is lots of good positive stuff. And you've heard two thirds of it already between <laughs> Charles and Stephanie. So I'll be really quick. Um, the first thing is, let me just give you a quick rundown on our numbers. And if you remember last year, I started talking with you about the percentage of students that were identified with having special education needs. And I was talking about some of our grade levels were really high percentages. I think third and fourth grade last year, we're in the 28, 29%. I don't want to say that we fixed it all the way, but we definitely are are are, are trending to work flat lining off. But right now we have 247 students in the district with um, IEPs. That's 20% of our entire population, which is a little bit higher than our pre-COVID percentages, which were more in the 14, 14, 15% range, but still I think we're we're shortening off nicely. Um, we have 94 students with 504 plans. Those are for accommodations and modifications based upon their disability. And we have 58 students that qualify as English language learners. So overall, I, overall, that's a total of 399 students in the district that are receiving some kind of um, support, which is, and, and that doesn't include our survey, that doesn't include anything else. If this is just kids that are getting state mandated or federally mandated protections and in, in, in instruction. So it's about 33% of our, our district is getting some kind of support either as an English language learner, 504 accommodations or special education. So our numbers are steady. I think we're not, we had a really huge identification rate last year and it, it just rolled, it steamrolled uphill all the way to June and it just kept building and building. So I think we're, we're in a much better place. The only place I'm worried right now, and just, just I'm planting the seed because um, I am the birth of three coordinator for the district. So I see everybody coming down the pipe. I'm getting information on 18 month olds and two year olds and, and sharing that with Jessica and the team at Valley View. But we have a high population of needs or a high percentage of students with special needs coming to us at, towards their third birthday. And some of those needs are pretty significant. Children that are hard of hearing or children that require walkers and medical um, needs uh, that are you know, um, going to carry over into the school environment. So we'll keep our watch. We have 39 students, uh, I'm sorry, 19 students in preschool right now that receive special ed services. And they're pretty spread between the four sections, you know, 2 a.m. and 2 p.m. But we do have um, a good handful of kiddos that are still coming our way that we know about. That doesn't include students moving into the district and everything. So. 
Um, and we're a little nervous. We have we have a, a pending um, maternity leave and pre-K, and we're trying to fill that. So it's uh, you know it's it's a busy time for pre-K between now and June. Of course, we wish Dina uh, Judd, our one of our preschool teachers, all the best. But at the same time, we're we've got we've got a full house there. So that's where we're working right now in, in that. Any question on those numbers? Um, I'm curious to know from previous years how closely the number of students with identified needs from the birth three program match what you're actually seeing when they come to preschool. You mean how many children actually identi are identified? Yeah, like are you getting surprises or is what you know coming from birth to three now a pretty good predictor of what we'll see? No, unless they move in or out of district, we're pretty, because birth to three does that nice job with the transition planning and all of that. So we have a pretty good handle on who's coming in. Okay. But the one, the surprises, of course, are the people that come in or late referrals, mm -hmm. which we've had a couple of those in December as well. So, okay. Um, but, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not painting doom and gloom at this point because our numbers always, um, always creep up this time of year for birth or for, um, for our preschool classes. They start out with nice small numbers. They've got their pre-described typical peers, and then they've got a handful of students with um, IEPs, but then we know that that builds as we go throughout the year. Um, and that's also new referrals coming into the district in addition to birth to three. Does that answer your question? Yep. That's great. John, can I ask a quick question about um, when you're seeing kind of an increased number of, of children in birth three, anticipating possibly an increase in the number of preschool students in the future, is there is there a consideration for what like what a threshold might be for where we would need to increase our preschool sections? Is that something that you're considering at this point or that you have in your mind? Or we're not think, there yet. I don't think we're at a threshold. I think what makes me more nervous than anything right now is the intensity of need. Hmm. Um, I think that's probably more so. Our numbers aren't aren't that big, okay. um, and and they'll be manageable. But it's okay. the intensity of need. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, you know, and one of the things that we also look at sometimes when we're talking at PPT meetings for students that are in that three to five range, we offer half day only programming. But sometimes kids are coming with such a significant need that it would be better for them to be in full day programming. Mm -hmm. And so if anything, that might be a place where I come back to the board in the future and say, for some of these children, it might be better for them to be in a full day program. Mm -hmm. So maybe half day in the preschool and then half day, perhaps like in the ABA lab. So we're looking very carefully at all of that. Thank you. All right. The good news is we're keeping them in district. And yeah. they come and they, you know, it's fun when I talk to parents at their birth to three transition meeting and they're like, oh yeah, we know all about Valley View. We go play on the playground and <laughs> we walk our dog there and all those types of things. So it's, it's a welcoming opportunity for them. Um, oh, and then one last number I wanted to give you is our special programs across the district. That's life skills and bridges and all of those different programs. We have 61 students in those programs. So that's holding nice and solid from where it was last month as well. Um, so the next thing I have then is, is staffing updates. As you knew, we, we've been struggling to attract a speech language pathologist. We lost our speech language pathologist in October when she um, resigned. And we have been really fortunate to have four wonderful SLPs come from Cheshire Fitness. Um, they've done a great job. But as we know, anytime, just like anything else, when we contract with an outside business, we have to pay all of those costs and it winds up being a lot more. So that's that that's one of the, the biggest issues. And then the other is that of course we wanted to, it's we much rather prefer to have our SLPs on our on our staff. So we were um lucky enough about a month and a half ago that a young lady applied to be our um, new SLP and she's actually a Portland student, a Portland child. So she grew up in Portland. Um, she looks like she's still growing up. She's very young or maybe younger. <laughs> but I just, we, we, I walked her around as she began her career here last week and, and, you know, and she fit right in with high school. Or so. <laughs> but, um, but her name is um, Jillian McKinley and she uh, uh, joined us beginning last week and is hit with the ground with her feet running and she's very excited she's learning ct seds and she's um getting a good turnover from this the cheshire fitness people so when stephanie spoke about you know some residual funds that we're still going to need for cheshire fitness we didn't want a cold turkey to bring um jillian and just say okay you're up and running and and you know of course we would lose some traction with making up those hours that we owed some of our students so cheshire fitness is phasing out um through next week 
and they'll be, they'll be leaving us. The last place I will leave some Maine Cheshire Fitness for a little bit longer as well as at the middle school, high school, because we're still making up some of those hours at Gildersleeve and Brownstone. So Jillian is, is focused on Gildersleeve and Brownstone. As you know, we have Michelle Wright as our, as our wonderful speech pathologist at Valley View. And then we're going to keep our Cheshire Fitness person on for a little bit longer at the secondary school. And we're excited to have Jillian with us. She she remembers all those buildings, she takes, uh, except for the high school. She didn't go to Portland High School, but she uh, as she walked around, she was all excited to see some old friends and familiar faces. So mm -hmm. I felt like she knew more people in the schools than I did. It was kind of cute. <laughs> so that's one new staff member. The other new staff member, is, as we know, um, Kristen Levesque was our life skills teacher, and she resigned in December. And we, I went into a panic. I was my goodness, well, we're we going to find a teacher in the middle of the year, but the gods signed, uh, smiled upon us, and we were able to hire Brianna Paskowitz, who was looking for a, a new position, and she is a wonderful fit with our life skills team. This afternoon, after the high school dismissed, I spent a good hour and a half with her and the paras in the program, and they're all excited to be working together and have great ideas for the program. Bri uh, Brianna comes to us from another school district, but she's a fairly new teacher, too. And she's got great ideas, great experiences through her collegiate and, and first two years of teaching, a lot of experiences that she's bringing to the table. So we're excited to see what is um, what happens in the life skills program. So very lucky on both those, um, both those counts. Um, uh, funding. These are two, two things that um, I'll, I'll speak to just very quickly. Yes, the ESSER funds for a homeless, that was something that we found out I think during the summer that we would qualify for, we put in for it, just came through. And that's really been helpful because we do have a number of families that are impacted through homelessness. And one of the biggest issues that we work for and that costs us the biggest amount of money is the ability to transport them back to their, um, either um, back to Portland if they're staying in another town or other kids are staying in Portland that come from another town. And the way we do that is there's, they have to submit a form, the family submits a form, <laughs> and declaring themselves homeless so that we know to make sure that they get all of the things, all of the um, supports that they need, free and reduced lunch, transportation, ed stability, so that they could stay in their schools that they um, would be in otherwise, if that's appropriate, or to be able to get registered right away in the new school where they've landed to make sure that they don't get sent out any of their educational time. So we have right now about 16 families that are experiencing homeless, you know, homelessness in one way or another. And they're not all Portland families. Some of them are families that might perhaps live in Glastonbury, but the only um, house place they could find right now while they're homeless is to stay on the couch of somebody in, in Portland. So we have situations like that. Once a family is applied for that, then we uh, we work with the families and, and the district that we're sharing with the child or sharing the child with, and we split the transportation. So um, I tell you, that has been a tremendous feat with the shortage of transportation still out there. We're really lucky with our buses. We've got plenty of large bus transportation and and short you know, our, sm our small bus transportation. But when it comes to driving to a town a couple towns away, picking up one or two children and getting them back here to Portland, those things are really, really difficult to find right now. So um, our office works really hard to make sure that gets taken care of. So to find out that just last week that we, we received those ESSER funds for homeless transport, for, uh, the reason we wrote the, 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 the grant was for homeless transportation. So I was excited to get that. Um, so the other thing is, and this is brand new, the ink is still drying on the on the applications, but there is a, an, a CT sets implementation stipend that was just released a few days ago, mm -hmm. and we have to apply for it. It's, a, it's it's through the grant system, and we are qualified as a medium school district based on the number of IEPs that we have, so we're eligible for fifteen thousand dollars for this stipend. Dr. Britton and I have started to explore what we're going to do with those funds and how we're going to use them to. Um, offset some of the work that's been done through for, for CT sets in the district. It's been a big, big uplift thing as we've talked about, and, and I, I'm excited. We're about halfway through all of our IEPs and 504 plans getting into CT sets, which is huge because that means we're all of our staff is really well trained and working through all of the ups and downs. And I couldn't be more prouder of a group of professionals to get all of this done. It's no small feat. And 
doing a beautiful job of it. So we'll have more in, at next month's report to tell you what we're doing with that stipend. And I'm sorry, how much was that again? 15,000. 15,000. Yeah. And is that a competitive grant or essentially once you no, it's, the application? It's, yeah, it's, it's, guaranteed. It's, it's, it's guaranteed. Yeah, as long as we do the application right. <laughs> as long as we do the application right, as compared to you know, 20 districts out of 92 getting them for, for the other. This is uh, great. So it's exciting and it's a good way to put put some supports back in. That's great. I just have a question. CT says, how is that going? Have the bugs been kind of worked out of that at this point? Um, is it is it more manageable or is it still um, a source of? <laughs> I will tell you honestly, Meg, it depends on who you ask and when you ask us. Um, okay. Because yeah, I mean, I will tell you right now we're at the point where we are we're worrying closely about compliance now and getting IEP making. We're to the point that we can look to make sure all of our IEPs are getting out on time and not just drafts and things okay. like that. Okay. So we are we have tightened up really nicely. And like I said, 50 out of the 250 IEPs that we have in the 94 504 plans, half of them are already Im implemented, are, are put through that. Okay. Um, there are continue, I attended a meeting this afternoon and they're continually changing, you know, they're continually fixing things. You know, I was I was looking back, I was thinking back years ago, the, the platform we just left was called Frontline. It was the old original IEP draft. And I remember when they rolled it out to districts, it was competitive because they were competing for our business with all these other companies. And they brought us out, they fed us lunch, they brought us to a training. It was, it was free to all the districts that were buying in and everything was done and perfect. So you were just logging into this polished program. You had no problems with it. Well, it wasn't that way with CT said. And CT said wasn't comp competing with anybody. Everybody in Connecticut has to use it. So we're, you know, they working through the bumps. But to their credit, every week we go, we go to an online train, you know, into an online discussion group with with the folks from PCG, which is a company that built the program, as well as the CSDE and, and their representatives. And we're they tell us what's been worked through. For example, a big issue we've been having. Um, is parents not getting notification through the portal when we would send something out? Because the, the, the whole design is for when, if I finish, if, if I have your child's IEP and I finish it and I should send, you get an email that says, Meg Scatta, please log on and, and, and look at this paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't going out to parents. So one of the updates today was they've done some fixes and it should be working like with 99% accuracy. So those things continue to upgrade and, and, and move forward that way. So, but it's, but it, like I said, it depends on who you ask and what day you ask, because, you know, teachers are work, it's, it's, they're faster at it now than they were two months ago. And two months ago, they were faster when they did their first one, their first IEP or their first 504 plan. So everybody's getting getting more comfortable. With I know it. it wasn't it wasn't the um, data being put in. It was really the platform that was faulty, and and there were numerous complaints. So yeah. hopefully they they diminished it. Yeah, and and our staff, I would we were really fortunate. We're a small enough district. All of our staff last summer, all of our special ed staff was able to do the quality IEP training, which was a nine mo nine module training, really getting us ready for the new mm -hmm. IEP. Um, Form the itself. itself. Um, we didn't have the real form to work with, but the hypothetical form. And but because our all of our staff was able to do that, I think they hit the ground running as far as being able to write goals and objectives and all of that. But you're right; it's the platform itself that was mm -hmm. problematic. Okay. So but we're getting through it. We'll get to the other side, and yeah. you know, it'll it'll be it'll be a different story. So, any other questions on that? Those two funding sources. All right. Um, I just have a quick couple of other things. Um, oh, our next project, because you guys know me, I love projects, and <laughs> we had spoke during the budget process about the idea that we have these six young adults that need transition programming, and it's not appropriate to have our students in during their transition years at 18 to 22 years to be just doing a couple more years of high school. We need to build a program for them. So we have begun the groundwork to start a transition academy. 
Dr. Britton and I um, went before Christmas, the Christmas break, went and visited the Middlesex Transition Academy in uh, Middletown. They're on the Wesleyan campus. And they really, they're great because they, they've been up and running for many, many years. They've got all the mm -hmm. all the, the issues and kinks that we're anticipating. They've got all worked out. So it was a great resource for us to be able to go over and tour that. And our next steps are to be looking at our um, our town and be thinking about what do we have for facilities that we could use in the town here. Um, for I'll give you an example. Right now, we have two young ladies that are they're in their beginning their transit beginning of their transition years, and they do some of their days are carried out down here right in this actual building, and they come down in, near Jesse Ravicki's office and they they do some work there, and then they also go to the library and you know to um, to the post office and all the the, part, the parts of their town that is that is real and actual, so they're able to do that. So that as we look to build this program, we're looking for a site that will be able to. Um, house roughly six adult or six young adults and and, and a few paras and a, and a teacher and then be able to build that up so the next step besides having this goal in this dream is we we're putting together a committee and a couple of the parents from uh, some of these students are interested in being on, on the committee as well as we'll be looking to you know um, in, involve other people and then in the other pieces we will be you know we'll have to be thinking about the teacher that takes on that role the teacher that we just hired, Brianna, that we hired for the life skills program will stay the life skills teacher. She'll stay in Portland High School, middle school, and be the teacher there. Whereas the transition teacher is somebody off-site and is running around to jobs and, and recreational programs and all of those things, all of the activities that young adults do getting ready for their exit from the school district at the 27th. So more information to follow on that. Sorry, Any question? question. Is the reasoning to be for that program to be outside of the high school to make it easier to travel to various community locations? It's no, it's really it's really mandated by the state. It's oh. mandated because a, a transition program should be something based in a community, not based in a high school. Okay. So that that's the whole purpose. The fact that it's closer to the bus line, you know, if we wind up on Main Street, for example closer to the bus line for public transportation and all of those pieces, that will be mm -hmm. icing on the cake. But um, the idea is, is that is part of the state mandates for transition programming. So is that like you're looking to rent space or are we looking to do something with the space is donated or? It's, it's, I mean, I, I'd love to have it donated, but mm -hmm. it's gonna be dependent upon what we, we decide we need for space and what's available. That will, that will be part of our search. And if anybody from the board would like to be part of those discussions, I will keep that information coming up. Thank you, Don. All right, it is exciting. I know, I, was, <clears throat> I had to build one more project. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's all, that's all I have for tonight. Any other questions? All right, great, thank you everybody. Thanks so much, Don. Okay, it's in the men's, right? Uh, so specifically, just the part that I said the. Okay, so yeah, we want me to quickly repeat those. Um, sure. Yeah. Oh, so um, <laughs> so. We did we did submit in our the communications there were two emails from parents specifically parents in the life skills program commending uh, Ms. Levesque who's left us for the, the hard work that she's done um, and then we did have a resignation from a individual named Ms. Roden who was serving in the capacity as long term sub for our counseling department the only other communication I was referencing was we, we had the enrollment report for for February those those were the three communications is that what you missed. All right, thank you. Uh, I believe we can move on to new business and uh, item A is the open choice seats for 2023 and 2024. Sure, so um, let me quickly re re review what this is. And, and I, I sent you a bunch of, uh, sorry, Q and A, some, some, answers, some questions tonight and some of them touched on the open choice. Mm -hmm. So let, let me sort of lay this out just to give you a, a, a snapshot of, of what seats we're declaring, right? And then what seats we're keeping. So if you look at the memo I sent, just follow with me for a moment. 
Like look, look at first grade in the column headed where we are now, mm -hmm. right? We currently have in first grade, eight open choice students. If you look at next year, you'll see in second grade, we have eight students, right? Same thing. If you look at third grade, we currently have five open choice students. Next year, fourth grade, five open choice students. So what when I, when these aren't new seats. These are our current open choice students who we don't have any reason to believe, but we'll, we'll stay with us, mm -hmm. right? The only new seats that we're proposing are that for kindergarten, we offer 10 seats. Now, Jessica will tell you and I will tell you, we never fill 10 seats in open choice. This year we only had, if you look, two. It, it, yes, we wanna start our students as, as early as possible, but you know, it's, it's a lot to ask for a parent to put a five-year-old on the bus from Hartford here every day. Mm -hmm. We do get some, so we would declare 10. I think at most I've ever seen in kindergarten is four or five. Mm -hmm. Second grade, the first grade student picks up a little. Bit. So we currently have two kindergarten teachers, our students, excuse me. Our recommendation is that we open three additional seats in first grade so that the net gain of seats would be the 10 kindergarten students and three first grade. That's if we, if they all fill, which has to be what it is, they won't, right? They won't. Mm -hmm. So if you follow my, my math here, there are two open choice students in 12th grade. We anticipate that they will graduate. Mm -hmm. We anticipate that all of the open choice students will come back like next year. So 70 minus two will be 68. Then if you add the 10 open choice seats in kindergarten that we declare, that will get us from 68 to 78. Then if you add the three additional open choice seats in first grade, that gets us to the 81. Everybody follow my math? Mm -hmm. Sure. So what I'm, I'm asking for your permission to declare is 81 seats, which are the 68 of our current students returning, 10 seats in kindergarten, which I doubt will all fill, but they might, three additional seats at first grade so we can bring our first grade numbers from what is two to five, right? And then I'm gonna ask for an additional couple of seats that we say for our older grades, for our, our students in, I know I put 2012, it was supposed to be <laughs> grades 2-12, right? For our students in grades 2-12, we would say if there's a sibling out there, because that makes it very convenient for families, and we have had a couple of sibling requests come in, that we say, if you have a sibling that, you know, is in another school now and wants to join the sibling here in Portland, we would have three seats open for those. So if you add all that up, the total number is 85. What do I think we're really going to have next year? At, at least 68, and I'm hoping 70, because that's the number that we're, we're counting on in terms of, mm -hmm. of our, our fiscal outlooks. Mm -hmm. Right. That was a lot. I want to pause there and see if there are, are any questions. I, I do understand that. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have to declare more seats than you think you're going to get. So what, what's, we, when we declare seats, what we're saying is we're only declaring seats now in kindergarten and first grade. We're declaring, we have these openings, right? That, that students will see that they have in this whole new online lottery thing where they go, families from Harper can go in and pick, you know, mm -hmm. Rastoberry, Avon, Magna School, Portland, and then they rank order and then they go through the slaughter. We will say we're opening 10 students, uh, seats for kindergarten, three seats for first grade. Mm -hmm. That's all. Because the rest of the seats are occupied the rest of the by seats are currently occupied. by students. Right. Yeah. right. The rest of the seats are what? They're occupied by students. Right. right. Seats are taken. Yeah. Right. So we're, we're only going to declare in, in terms of new seats, 13 openings, 10 right. kindergarten, three first grade. Every other seat is full, right? Except we'll 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 put the carve out that if it's a sibling request, we'll do that. So you know that Portland's pass is has always been start for students as early as, as we can, open the seats at in at Valley View. And then all of the other students, generally those are students who started with us, you know, at this point are working their way, matriculating their way through up, including the two we have on track to graduate this year. Mm -hmm. You said they, you're all set? Uh, Dave, no, I just, sure. again, I, did we offer 10 this year and we only got two? Yes. 
Yeah. But there was a chance some they could ten people could sign up and we would have to take them. Yeah, it's never happened before. But <clears throat> I, I personally would probably say, why don't we stick with a lower number like five? Like, if you think it's going to be four or five, let's make it four or five. Let's not shoot for the stars and then, you know, what if? So. Anyway, but yeah, that's just like. And I think if I could pick up on that thread, is I think past years aren't really a good indicator of this year and into the future because there was significant legislation passed that re-emphasizes and it encourages, and you might want to say, gives a pretty good shove to. Um, have students move out of the Hartford district into the surrounding open choice districts. Just in the paper in the last couple of weeks, I saw two articles that, you know, so I think if we're saying, well, we'll, we'll declare the seats, but they probably won't really get filled. Mm -hmm. I, I, I suspect that's not going to be the case this year. I think it's a, it's a stronger case to be made that we will see um, because the, the district is going to be, I think, working very assertively with families to um, move along the process of moving students out of the Hartford district because that's been the whole goal all along. And the most recent legislation in court case all led to to emphasize that to push that further forward. So I it's in and really my only concern and, and I said in an email to you was that taking students at the higher grade. And, and I guess when you talk about only sibling requests, is that are those numbers that aren't known to us? Because it would, I would suspect that we would know if there's siblings, if we have students here who have siblings in the school district um, in Hartford still that might want to come. And then, you know, there'd be some ability to kind of estimate that rather than just kind of throw open the door and say, well, we'll see what happens. No, he's capping it. He's capping it at, you said three. He said he would cap it at three, open three seats potentially for siblings. Right, we Maybe would declare opening for any grade level, mm -hmm. any and you know as you know any student that gets sent our way is ours. We mm -hmm. there's no process on that other than you know we accept them and provide whatever services they need. Um, it I just think it's a lot more difficult when you have students come in you know junior year, senior year, sophomore year who've never been in a, in a small town school district and uh, that's the reason why when this whole started you know years ago because we got in trouble with funding <laughs> with the state on construction for the high school um you know the emphasis was on lower grades that we would keep in the lower grades and that would really help the entire process uh, move forward in a much much better fashion yeah i, I mean look i, I I think if you if you ask Jessica Brown, in her conversations with parents of kindergarten students from Harvard, we we are getting more kids come want to come in first grade than kindergarten. Kindergarten, no. you know, they're just they're very little. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That hasn't changed since I was a dad. I mean, you're asking a lot. Right. Are in Hartford, put their five-year-old on a bus to drive them forty-five minutes every night. Yeah, right. you know, it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot, and, and you know. I don't think I, I've seen most of the years I've seen growth has been in first grade. I think parents start to get more comfortable in first grade, you know, with with that than than kindergarten. I mean, it's if you think about it, it's only really been five years now, Don, right? Since full day kindergarten has been the norm in most districts. I know when my son was in kindergarten, it was only half day, right? I mean, so again, could those ten seats fill? They could. Would would I expect they will? I don't. You know, could, but could we put it at five? We, we could. I mean, so I guess to Tim's point, say we get 10 kids enrolled in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. If we're able to accommodate that many children, and, uh, you know, I guess, you know, let's play that scenario out, Charles. We get 10 yeah, students enrolled in you, kindergarten. You look at it, then Charles, what? That, that, you know, the only other one is sixth grade. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some, there's even closer to that. But you, it, in 10th grade, I mean, if, if we had 10 kindergartners, in, Enroll, you know, we would would have to be looking at at how many um, students you know enroll this spring and summer, right? We you know budgeted for five. Mm -hmm. You know, if it we will we will make sure that kindergarten class sizes, kindergarten being what it is, and that those classes only have one pair of professional heading into next year as mm -hmm. a support, right? We don't do classroom aids. We'll make sure that the class sizes are reasonable, which might mean I come and ask you for that extra kindergarten teacher. But 
hey, if, if that were to happen, it would mean because there were 10 open choice students, which would bring in $100,000 in revenue to us, mm -hmm. which is exactly how we're paying for this year's kindergarten teacher. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I mean, we're, we're ledgering our 70, and I wrote from the fact two and 80, where the, where's the money going to for open choice? One of the places is we added the, the kindergarten teacher this year for six sections of, of kindergarten. That's how we're paying for it. We added, we increased our ELL teacher from 0.5 to 4, 0.5 to 1.0. That's how we're paying paying for this. If, you know, so the, the funding would be there if we needed to add the sixth kindergarten section because we had 10 Hartford Open Choice students joining us in kindergarten. Yeah. So two things. I, I think it's, I think it's really great to open seats for siblings. If we have children who are coming to us in Portland who are loving their experience and whose families are so delighted with their experience here that they want their siblings to have the opportunity to come to school here too, I think that's that's wonderful. And I, I think if we wanna, if we're able to accommodate three more children that way, that's great. Um, I don't have a problem with the number 10 in kindergarten if you're saying to us, we can accommodate 10 students in kindergarten. If, if that, would potentially, if in the next year, also saying we're not going to get 10, but I'm saying if we do get 10, as long as you're confident that we can accommodate that number, then I'm comfortable with that. But if you're saying if we get 10 students, it's going to cause, you know, problems, then, or we're not able to accommodate that, then I would agree, let's lower the number. But otherwise, if you're, if you're comfortable with the number 10, then I think I can get, I can be on board with that. I would just add that the Chef O'Neill ending, uh, ending that um, court case, the dust was settling last year. A lot of parents didn't know that they were opening up extra seats in Hartford in some of the um, correct schools. So I think this year, because Portland has done such a great job with our open choice kids, parents will be looking for other options, you know, knowing 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 the full um, the full rollout of of the uh, legislation. So we may end up with eight or ten kids, and I hope we do. That's a great, great place to to start from. This is a really minor point, but if you're opening up three seats for siblings, would would the total be 84, not 85? Yes. Okay, that's my math too, Sarah. So I have 81, three seats, 84. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Good question. But the, can I just ask quickly the target number? It's not like we're trying to reach 84 or 85 as a target number. You're just looking at what we currently have in mm -hmm. terms of our students who are joining mm -hmm. us from Hartford and the number of seats you are comfortable opening in kindergarten. Plus the addition of siblings if they're interested, and that's how we're arriving at eighty four. Right. It's a great number. Yeah, and it, it's yes, and and I think that that's yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would just say for me that I think the ten kindergarten and the two first grade that's that's right, that's very much in alignment with what our district wanted to do and proposed to do and we can continue to do. I think the uh, the three sibling, the unknown variable of not knowing what grade level those students would come in at, that to me is troublesome. And it, it, it would be better to not do that. Not do the sibling. Not to do the sibling piece. Not unless we could declare for low, only lower grades and, and that we had the, you felt we had the capacity in order to do that. Yeah, I, I, what's interesting about the sibling is it is it, it would likely go like this. I wouldn't even declare the siblings. I mean, because they're not, that would mean identifying a grade level and opening the extra seat. But mm -hmm. I, what I would like is that, hey, if Open Choice calls me and says, you have a student in uh, fourth grade who has a sibling that would like to come to your school, the flexibility to say, yes. But it's not. That's not a, a declaration of a seat. It's a. I want to be able to say to Open Choice, "Hey, we're opening ten seats in kindergarten and three additional seats for our first graders." That's. Those are the new ones. That's it. But if you have a sibling out there, call me. Did, did, my, did I misunderstand? Because I thought the language that you proposed <clears throat> was that we would declare a total of eighty. Well, maybe not eighty-four. It was oh, eighty-five. 85. That we, well, it was 85, and but now we're saying we would declare yeah, I would say 80. We, well, so let me back. 81. We're going we're gonna to declare 10 seats. My, my recommendation, we can bring that number down if you're more comfortable with it. 10 kindergarten, 
10 new seats in kindergarten, three first grade. Everything else, else is not declared their current students. And then I, I'm just asking for uh, a recognition that if I get a call from prep saying there's a sibling request above first grade, mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm authorized. I think it just might be the language in the in the proposed motion where it says declare us to. Sure, so yeah. maybe that right. That's is yeah. what. Yes, yeah, so really. I guess struggle. It, I don't. Maybe the language should be then to to declare eight ten seats in kindergarten. Right, seats, additional. Ten new seats in kindergarten. Right. Three new seats in first grade, <laughs> and then the flexibility for up to three sibling requests if they come up. But in terms of what we're actually no, I would I would even stop it there. You know, the declaration is is the seats we're going to open. Right. The question is, you know, what happens when we get a call that hey, you have a student in um, second grade who has a sibling who you know, would prefer would like to come to you? Is that a is that a hard no? Or? So maybe the maybe the motion is we're declaring what we're declaring, and then able and then able to accept up to a total of. If we were to receive a sibling, sibling request. request, correct. And that, that's that's yeah, a good clarification. That down, yeah. So just to Something. clarify, if we got ten kids in kindergarten, you would not have to add a teacher. That depends on how many court right. does it. <laughs> depends on who else shows up. <laughs> because my one of my thoughts, thinking outside, is that. They say, yeah, this is great, 10 sign up. And then after two months, they say, this is ridiculous, putting my kid on the bus and half of them drop out. We've already hired a teacher. And now what do we do? Our funding is based on our num our enrollment numbers as of October 1. Yeah. So yeah, but then our funding goes away if the kids go away, right? How many yeah. kids have we yeah. actually lost? I think we haven't. Well, yeah, I mean, it, I mean they we don't one lose or funding, two, but it's not. We don't lose funding. If they're here on October one and they withdraw October two, we still keep. We still get the funding. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And it's oh. the opposite too. If students come in, we don't get ten thousand for them either. Yeah. I'm just throwing it out. I got. I'm, yeah. I'm all for the open choice because um, I've been here for many years and I know we were in the low fifties at one point. So we've gradually every year yeah. increased this. So we've been, I think, doing our fair share. And I think this is a 20% increase over last year. I, I, I just, to me, as a number guy, that just feels aggressive. And, it, and I don't want it to be based on us making more money. As a sole reason. That, it, that we don't anticipate what is this going to cost us as far as any additional resources down the road somewhere. But I think I asked this to Dawn a couple of years ago that if any of them have special needs, that cost is covered from the original district, correct? It is. So if, if it exceeds the threshold of the amount that we get per student, and for this year it's ten thousand dollars, special ed costs that exceed that threshold are reimbursed by public. Yeah, I think you said that. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm just throwing out what ifs. Yeah. It, it sounds like you, you might be more comfortable with the kindergarten number eight. I mean. To me, it doesn't make sense. You throw a 10 when you expect to get four or five. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, make it four or five. Yeah. Let's just, then we can plan for that. But we have other grades where we have six or seven or eight or nine, in one case, nine students in that grade. And uh, in my first year that I started, we got eight kids. We got eight kindergartners. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's like grade five or six right now. Yeah. Absolutely. And can I clarify the number two under the program funding early beginnings grant? Does that really mean 16,500 for each kindergarten student? It would be the 10,000 plus 6,500. Is that how I'm reading this? It says for each resident pre-K and kindergarten student enrolled. Oh yes, you yeah, get an, an additional 6,500. So additional 6,500 dollars for kindergarten per student. For kindergarten. Yeah. yeah. Is that new? No. That, okay. I we that. got that because I remember when we got those eight kids, I was like, what's all this money for? Yeah. And yeah. when I emailed, they told me it was because of that. It's, then, it's 10,000 for first grade and above. And you know, you get an additional 6,500. And then we also get additional funding if there's a certain number in the same class or the same grade 
I don't know around that, but we also get additional funding for that as well. Mm -hmm. and, then the, and the whole class benefits from it because we can use the funds for all the kids in kindergarten. At the, the remediation uh, component of it. Um, they, they brought in um, teachers from CREC actually from Open Choice to come in and sit with kids and do the um, phonics and all of the intervention work that needed to be done. They sat in the library and met with kids. So you wanna you wanna I think you had an I should put together a draft motion. So I think that you the 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 it, again if, if it's comfortable with whether that number is ten or eight, you know, I think that that's a, a discussion for the board. But the 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 ask is to declare ten kindergarten seats and three first grade seats. That's it, right? And then with the um ability to add up to three siblings above first grade that that would be but the real the hard part is is the declaration is only going to be like the form that you saw on there that i would fill out it's if you look in the form there's that mm -hmm. chart that i have to fill out yeah. i would put 10 for kindergarten unless you lower that number to eight and three for first grade then the understand expectation is all the other ones are our current students and that's that's pretty consistent with past Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with 10. I don't know how anybody else feels, but I think I 10 either. is a reasonable number. I, I, I would it. I would agree, Meg. I, I feel comfortable with if you're telling me that you're comfortable with 10 seats in kindergarten, then I feel comfortable with 10 seats in kindergarten. I didn't I'm I'm fine with 10. I, my concern remains with the, the unknown variable of the three other students that we don't that aren't kindergarten. Yeah. But I, I appreciate the clarification that you're not declaring specific seats for these siblings. You're opening up the option group prec for um, for them to reach out if there are siblings interested and for you to be able to, to be flexible in your assessment of whether that works. Um, and yeah. If I could just add, and that, my understanding with, with open choice is that once you declare a seat, you know, the student that comes is a student that comes and that's, you know, you prepare and you're ready and you provide the education. With the sibling situation, if, if it's not a declared, official declared seat, do you have discretion over people who come? And yeah, okay. Yes, because it's not a declared seat. Okay, yeah. Right. yeah. So you were able to use your judgment as the superintendent with your team on the impact and of what course, we're doing. And that's what I do with it. I will go over right. the leadership team and say, you know the, the uh, makeup of the class. You you know right. what the challenges are. What do you see? Mm -hmm. And you know, they may say no. <laughs> you know, this is a bad idea, and I would I would reserve to go and say no. Um, but if it's a yeah, we it, we we feel like we could sort of do this, we, we would. Can I just ask some enrollment numbers real quick? Just looking at the enrollment figures. So right now, the first grade class has 79. The current kindergarten class has 95. Of those two are choice. So you're saying you want to open up three seats in first. So that would make that 95, potentially 98 students. Mm -hmm. And in first grade, you have five classrooms? Six. Because there's six. Six, there five sections that follow the kindergarten to first. There are six sections of kindergarten. So okay. Feasible role. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Because I was going yeah. to be concerned yeah. that would be it's 20 students role. per yeah. class in first grade, but it's a, will be across six. Thank you. Yeah. The, the budget <clears throat> that the budget that we just passed included the provision of a, an additional section of first grade, Thank which you. this year was the kindergarten okay. section. So Thank that's you. what happened with the school kids here. It started yep. and then it'll drop off after here. Yeah, that's a good yeah. point. And what we budgeted Thank for next year is five kindergarten sections. Okay. But yep. of course, you know, hey, if it comes if the enrollment comes in real low, we may only need four. If it comes in real high, we may need seven. <laughs> right. Um right. That's what unknown. That's yeah, no, that's one yep. of the Wind at the back or wind in the mm -hmm. face. Sure. Are there additional questions for Charles about this? Thoughts? Nope. Um, 
with do you want to shall I say the motion so we can get it right is is anybody okay I believe I am looking for a motion to recommend to the board of education that the district declare uh 10 kindergarten seats and three first grade seats in the open choice program with the flexibility for Dr. Britton to add up to three more seats for siblings above grade one during the school year of during the 2023-24 school year I'll make that motion Thank you, Meg. Is there a second? I'll second. Oh, I think I heard Kim. Thanks, Kim. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Nope. I believe it was unanimous. All right. Thank you. Okay, the next item under new business is a new position in the schools for a bus monitor, and we are going to discuss this in executive section. So we'll move on to old business, and there is no old business. So we can move on to our committee reports. Curriculum had no meeting in January, but we will be meeting um, next week, I believe. Policy? Policy is meeting in April. Personnel. We had a meeting. We're going to be discussing it during executive session. <laughs> we did, yes, we did. I had to think through. What did we talk about? Uh, bus monitors. Um, buildings and grounds. Uh, no meeting uh, scheduled right now. All right. Trek is the third week of February. Board of Selectmen. That's a really good thing. All right. Uh, Committee on Solidarity. They had their last meeting. I wasn't able to attend. It was a conflict. Was so cool. Equity and inclusion. There, oh, it's only me now, right? Um, and Sarah. Oh, and you're on. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, they really aren't yet. They're they're working hard to, um, I want to say, re reignite the passion with that and kind of bring together the team you know, fresh again to address some of those issues. Unfortunately for me, the new meeting date they picked, there's a conflict for mm -hmm. me every month. So, okay. you know, I'm, I don't expect them to change their meeting, but it, I may not be able to, you know, I'll try and see what I can do, yeah. but I may not be able to participate with, the, with those meeting times. Okay, that's good to know. But Sarah, you'll be able to... Uh, I'll okay. find out Maybe. when the new meeting date is. Okay. It's a, <laughs> I think it's the first Monday of the month from four to six is what I can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can revisit that. Yeah. Uh, we would definitely want to make sure we've got some board members um, participating in that work for sure. Um, school Facility Study Committee. February 12th, I believe, next Monday. Um, if we six. have. Yes. No. Six was yesterday. Oh, March. Oh, March. Oh, March. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, so it's been <laughs> now it's yeah. March. Yeah. So don't, don't be worried. You confuse me. We're meeting Lou, Stephanie, and I are meeting with the Hartford Department of Administrative Services this week to talk about the last thing we yeah. need. Okay. And then it's go time with our committee. So so now we're off to March. Okay. Yeah. Did we get the you want? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Um our audience of citizens. Do we have anyone <laughs> left online who wishes to address the board? Nope. All right, thank you. Board of Education member comments. Uh, I guess we'll start over on this side today. Tim, any comments? Uh, no, I'm gonna reserve. I, I think we had a healthy discussion about the open choice and I appreciate sure. that. I, I wasn't as excited about the email that I received earlier, but I, you know, I'm, I, I think this was a good, healthy discussion and I appreciate it. Okay. Sarah? Um, Hearing about all the different funding sources, it does make me wonder if there's a way for us to sort of get a compiled list of those or if that exists somewhere on the drive, um, because I think that would help at least me orient myself to what are our sources of income versus our expenses. And if I appreciate look at the um, that. PowerPoint I did for the yeah. board. With the, the, it's I think it's great. One of the last slides. It's on the right. book, too, from the budget book. Right. 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 And there have been some up, and there have been some updates. You're talking about like when grants come in, yeah. and is there is there a master list that yeah that we could 
maybe that you could add to that um, yeah. beautiful drive that you put together for us with all the yeah, we can, information. Yeah. I told you that. Yeah, I know. I have it. And I said, and as a matter of fact, there are some of them on that list that we don't know yet, right? Like the ECS grant, right? Mm -hmm. right? Um, which is. Well, no, he's there. She's talking about I could do this year's because we have oh, yeah. I have all the the funding for this year. Mm -hmm. okay. And I I had I created a document as funding sources, and it's all the title grants, the IDA, and then all the you know um, one year, two year, three year, like the SIG grant, the ESSER money, and how we're spending each of it each year, and how much is left. And now I'll add the mental health grant on. Um, That'd be beautiful. Yeah. And then <laughs> you know, revenue sources like Oak Hill, mm -hmm. uh, and then. You know, some of the other grants we get. And the other one too that like the Gilder City grant that mm -hmm. check that on the board meeting mm -hmm. So yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah. All right. Anything else, Sarah? No. Okay. Thank you. Meg. Um today I testified at the committee um for early for childhood. I have to look at the name again, but um Liz Lenahan is the co-chair. It was about a Senate bill 929 about free lunches to be funded and continued. Um, probably not in perpetuity, but at least for the next couple of years to alleviate some of the uh, food insecurity and guarantee that kids uh, kids are getting nutritious meals. We know sometimes there's lack of funding. We also know that um, they're not always bringing in the healthiest uh, foods, um, particularly elementary school kids with all those tubes and packages and whatnot. So um, there was a lot of um, support for funding for all kids, not just uh, kids who have uh, free and reduced lunches. So I thought that was interesting. And I spent the weekend last weekend in Washington, D.C., and we did meet with our congressional contingency. Um, there's a lot of strange things going on down there, but hopefully people are staying on the committees for early childhood and for um, education. And um, if they do, we'll hopefully see some, some further funds for infrastructure maybe HVAC and other things. So um, it was a good discussion, very big, um, a lot of equality discussions on Saturday, advocacy on Sunday. So I'll share that with um, Laurel and uh, Charles and she can dispense that information. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was that. a lot of learning. Yeah, it was good. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll look on to this end. Kim, any comments? Um, I guess a couple of questions. One, I'm wondering about the governor just announced new security grants and if there was a plan to look at applying for any of those this time around. And kind of in that same vein, when we had a, a public comment regarding security um, with an idea that was brought up, I'm wondering how we go about having a board discussion about that idea. Do we get that on an agenda, an agenda in the future? Um, just wondering those two things. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Do you want me to address? Let me they start with the security. So we have already received the grant money. So the, there were there are two security grants. One of them is the interoperability grant. We have right now available to us. Well, the grant is awards for eighty thousand. We get reimbursed fifty four percent of it. We have to come up with the eighty, and they reimburse us fifty four percent of it. And, and specifically what that $80,000 would be for would be to purchase new radios, the interoperability, mobility, I'm not the exact name of it. But these are radio, if you walk around any of our buildings all the time, you see all of us carrying radios, right? And of course, they're helpful to communicate in school. But the purpose of this grant is to give, equip us with digital radios that if first responders are coming to the school, they can patch into us immediately so that we could tell them where to send the ambulance or the fire truck. Um, and we have the 40, 50, 80,000, 52% reimbursement. The problem is we have to come up with the other, right? The other 80 minus 52%, help me out, Stephanie. What's what the <laughs> 42. Right, we have to come up with our 42,000. Well, no, so, we have to come up with the whole thing. It's a reimbursement, we so we reimbursed. have to pay yeah. the full 80, and then they reimburse us back the 46 or whatever it is. Right. So we already have that. So the, the grant there is for districts that weren't as on top of it as we were last year when we got it. Now we want to spend that money. We want to access that. But we, that means we have to find $80,000, buy these radios, and then submit the bill and get the 52% back. And 
you know, as you know, this year's budget has been a little tough. <laughs> so Stephanie and I have not been comfortable fronting eighty thousand dollars with Stephanie saying we have a big deficit. Now that Stephanie's reminding uh, us what data it is and, and we're in a better <laughs> position, we're working on. Bob, who's amazing, is also aware of other revenue sources in the town that uh, power funds and other types of things that we might be able to do. So my hope is that before the end of this year, either with placeholder left savings that we might generate or other revenue sources, we can access that grant and spend it. But for this round of grant funding, we wouldn't apply for it because we already got it. Does that make sense? There's a lot of dots on there. That would just be in that would be additional things we could apply for, but we really need to be able to afford this first one before we go and apply for another one. Okay. But we have we have it there, and this would be a, a tremendous upgrade and, and both equipping our all of our buildings with, with new radios to communicate within the building, but also Dr. Lake, we ever need to communicate with first responders come come and provide treatment. Um, so we already have done that. We have the grant. Now it's just about finding our matching parts of it uh, and accessing, paying the full amount and then accessing that as a first. Yeah. And as for the second, your second question about when we have public comment, do things become an agenda item if we wish to discuss them further? And the answer is yes. If we wish to, to pursue something, we would add it to an agenda in a future meeting. Um, the topic about SROs is something that the board recently discussed. Um, was it last summer, last early in the fall, mm -hmm. end of the summer? summer? Yeah, it was in the summer. summer. It was in the summer. Yeah. Um, oh, so I I don't know that that's something that we're looking to add to the agenda right now. But if there are if there is consensus of the board to add a topic to the agenda, then we can bring that up and we can make that happen. Um, but I think the feeling is we have a lot on our plate right now, uh, particularly with the school renovation coming up, and that. Allowing allowing Charles and the admin team to kind of focus on on that um, yeah. is maybe the, the right strategy at this moment. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yep. Thank okay. you, Stacy. Did you have any comments? Um, just appreciative of the DECA presentation. I love when the students yeah. come and and they you know they present their work and just really happy to see this. I yeah. just I think it's great. So. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. That's our journalism first though. Yeah, I great. think that's wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. and I'm really excited. I want to get a uh, spotlight on our writing center. Also, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. Good stuff. Good that's great. I Stacy, I totally agree. I really, really enjoy our our school spotlight. I think it's a really lovely way to feature some interesting and exciting things that are happening in the district. Um, so I know that you're working with with administrators to to kind of point out, figure out what other kinds of special things to feature. But also I would say if there, you know, if we have teachers in district who have something exciting happening that they want to throw out to you as a potential spotlight that they should do that. And and credit to Chris has been great helping put that together and communicating and organizing. We have a calendar set up now for the rest of the spring. We have some pretty cool things. That's great. I'm excited for that. Yeah. Hey. I'm good. No? Okay. No. All right. Um, and I think I'm all set. So uh, I believe that if there is a motion, we can move to executive session for the purpose of uh, discussing the new position. Can I interrupt what? one thing? Oh, Stephanie yeah. reminded me. <laughs> She's very good at that. Uh -huh. Thursday night this week at 6.30, the, we are meeting with the Capital Improvement Committee for the town. That's okay. the long range capital. We're, we're scheduled um, for that. We have to change the date. Like they're, they're, gotcha. so the cal calendar's out. So I will be there, Bob will be there, Stephanie will be there. We'll be sharing with the town our capital improvement plan. It's certainly anybody on the board is available at 6.30. We're gonna be in town hall in the conference room there. Otherwise, I think you, you know what the capital requests are. Yeah, yeah. Share those with you. Yeah. Um, that's largely what we'll be sharing with us. Okay. Oh, thank you for that. That's good to know. Uh, where were we? Oh, executive motion. session. I Is there a motion to go into executive session and invite Dr. Britton to join us? And it's 849. All right. Thanks, Meg. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Tim. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. <laughs> 